In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to discuss the issue of post-operative pain after arthroscopic shoulder surgery that can occur despite preoperative regional anesthesia, and specifically pain that is localized to the chest and axillary region. The shoulder is a complex anatomical structure, and its innovation is similarly complex. Now, we often think solely in terms of the skin incision and the glenohumeral joint, but pain can arise in the shoulder from many different sources, not all of which are supplied by branches of the C5-6 roots or the brachial plexus. And this includes capsular connective tissues, muscles, as well as bony structures. Arthroscopic shoulder surgery is a classic example of surgery with very small cutaneous incisions that is nevertheless associated with significant post-operative pain. And these patients often arrive with chronic pain issues and underlying inflammatory injuries, and the surgery itself involves debridement or trauma to many different tissues. It highlights the fact that in regional anesthesia, we must not be misled by the tendency to describe innervation and pain sensation purely in terms of cutaneous maps of dermatomes or peripheral nerves. A C5-6 to brachial plexus block, either in interscalene or superior trunk, is widely viewed as the gold standard for regional analgesia after arthroscopic shoulder surgery. It's usually highly effective with patients experiencing little to no pain, and in fact, some shoulder surgeries can be done awake under these blocks alone. Yet at the same time, it is not uncommon for patients to experience some intraoperative and postoperative pain despite what seems to be an effective block. In this study, comparing three different block approaches, 15 milliliters of 0.5% ropivacaine was administered prior to surgery in all groups and all patients. The majority underwent rotator cuff repairs lasting 90 minutes on average. And we see that while on their post-operative pain scores and opioid needs were low, they were by no means zero, and some patients needed more than others. Note that these whiskers are the standard error of the mean, and that the standard deviation was actually much larger in all cases. Now, one of the issues that may contribute to this, which we often see in complex and prolonged arthroscopic surgery, is fluid extravasation into the soft tissues in the, of the chest and shoulder, leading to postoperative pain in the chest wall and axilla. This fluid extravasation is well documented in the orthopedic literature. In this relatively recent systematic review, a total of 26 published studies involving 205 patients were identified all of which were case reports or case series. Now, irrigation fluid and pressure is clearly a factor. Mean volumes in most of these studies was over 20 liters and as much as 76 liters in one report. In these reports, the main clinical features were swelling of the chest wall, sometimes extending into the neck and face. And not surprisingly, apart from chest discomfort, there is the risk of respiratory distress from the physical compression of tissues and actual airway compromise requiring prolonged intubation. In most cases, however, the edema does resolve within 24 hours. Another problem that can arise is subcutaneous emphysema and even pneumothorax. These reports are from the early 1990s, but this can still occur even today. Here is an x-ray of a patient recently treated at a hospital in Toronto who had a three-hour-long arthroscopic surgery of the right shoulder. You can see that, apart from the very impressive swelling, she also has subcutaneous emphysema that she developed postoperatively. This was associated with both chest pain as well as shortness of breath. The obvious temptation here is to blame the regional anesthesia block for any subcutaneous emphysema or pneumothorax, but this is highly unlikely with ultrasound-guided interscalene or superior trunk blocks and has been reported even in the absence of any blocks being performed. The mechanism is not entirely understood, but most papers postulate that the cause is surgical, that there is entrainment of air that occurs with the use of active irrigation systems. Now returning to the more common problem of just pain resulting from fluid extravasation into the chest wall and shoulder, it's likely that this pain is transmitted from anterior terminal branches of the upper thoracic intercostal nerves the anatomy of which is actually much more complex than is currently depicted in most sources. As you can see from this anatomical study, there are multiple branches which fan out to the intercostal muscles and over the surface of the chest wall. And although the pectoral nerves would appear important given the amount of intramuscular fluid disruption we see, 
the lateral pectoral nerve at least would be covered by the C5 to 6 block. So they're clearly not the only consideration here. Furthermore, complaints of axillary pain may be due to involvement of tissues in the territory of the intercostal brachial or T2 nerve and the medial brachial cutaneous nerve. So what do we do about it? You can, of course, give the patient opioids, and this is what our PACU nurses often do. However, there are times when this does not relieve pain adequately or starts to cause issues with sedation and side effects, which are undesirable, especially as many of these patients are scheduled as day surgery cases. Clearly then, as regional anesthesiologists, the specific question is, do we have a block for that? And of course we do. Now, although I mentioned that the pectoral nerves are expected to be covered by an interscalene or superior trunk block, supplementing that with a preoperative PEX2 block may actually help in terms of reducing axillary pain specifically. Barbara Vasek and colleagues have nicely demonstrated that interpectoral and subpectoral local anesthetic in a PEX2 block performed lateral to the midclavicular line will track into the axilla. The clinical relevance of this is supported by this RCT, which investigated the addition of a PEX2 block in patients who had a biceps tenodesis as part of their arthroscopic shoulder surgery. And this specifically involves surgery that has an axillary component to the incision. As you can see here, they found that the PEX2 block significantly reduced pain scores and opioid consumption in the early postoperative period. And when patients were specifically asked, it was axillary pain that was mainly reduced. Based on the findings of this RCT, I personally will now often incorporate a PEX2 block in patients for whom a biceps tenodesis is planned. However, the PEX2 block is not feasible as a rescue block because of the fluid that disrupts the visualization of the planes and probably any effective spread of fluid. Instead, where there is post-operative, posterior shoulder pain or pain in the chest and axilla, the rescue block that I usually perform first is a T2 or T3 ESP block. Its application to shoulder pain was first described by my friend Mauricio Ferrero in a remarkable case that we reported in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. This short video shown here with the patient's permission illustrates the effect. We've had from 0 to 10, the 0 to 10, how is your pain usually when you are lifting your arm? When you start levantando eight. la... 8. 8 out of 10. Okay, thank you. Try to lift it more, please. Try to levantarlo más. Okay. Okay. Do your movement. ¿Cómo está el dolor? Tirando un 5%, casi nada. Polvo cero, ¿verdad? Sí. Despite that, I must say I still do not use it as a first-line block for primary surgical analgesia as I find that the C5-6 block still works better, being more reliable and consistent in its effect. But as a rescue block, I have found that it works well for pain in the anterior chest and axilla or posterior shoulder. Most importantly, it can be performed even when there's fluid extravasation as the target area over the transverse processes is not usually involved. Now at this time, there are no studies or even case reports in the literature, so all I have to offer you is my own personal experience. To perform the block, I generally turn the patients lateral, keeping them semi-recumbent if that's more comfortable for them. And as described in my thoracic epidural video, I identify the T2 to T3 transverse process by tracing back from the first rib in the supraclavicular fossa. It will be a lot higher up in the shoulder than you expect and often quite deep due to the bulk of the overlying trapezius muscle. A curved probe may sometimes provide a better view if it is very deep. And this video illustrates this. The T2 rib and transverse process is identified with a traceback approach from the first rib. T3 lies deeper because of the bulk of trapezius, so T2 is targeted in this instance.
I usually insert the needle in a caudal cranial direction and inject 20 milliliters of 0.5% ropivacaine or some similar long-acting local anesthetic. Once the correct plane has been identified and opened up, pain relief is usually obtained in 5 to 10 minutes. I'll finish off with highlighting a couple of other sources of postoperative pain after arthroscopic shoulder surgery and possible solutions in terms of blocks. I've learned from colleagues who routinely do awake shoulder surgery that anesthetizing the supraclavicular nerves, which are the lower branches of the superficial cervical plexus, is essential to prevent intraoperative pain from the acromioclavicular joint. It's therefore an appropriate block to perform if there is postoperative pain in this area and if this block wasn't done preoperatively. Personally though, I incorporate it into all my superior trunk blocks as described in my YouTube video on the superior trunk block. It can be done very easily as a subcutaneous infiltration of five to 10 mils of local anesthetic over the middle scalene muscle at the level of the C5-6 roots of superior trunk. These nerves lie in the superficial subcutaneous tissues and are often visible with careful tracing proximally and distally. A 25 gauge hypodermic needle can be used to create this infiltration, although in this example, a regular 22 gauge block needle is shown. Finally, if you consider that the initial preoperative C5 to 6 block may not have worked as well as intended, Apart from performing a repeat interscalene or superior trunk block, an option to consider is a sub omohyoid suprascapular block. This has the advantage of reducing the risk of a significant phrenic nerve palsy or causing extensive motor block of the upper limb, which might result if you just simply repeat an interscalene or superior trunk block. The suprascapular nerve is easily identified by tracing the superior trunk from its origin. It's the most lateral and superficial round hypoechoic structure that separates from the superior trunk. As you slide the probe distally towards the clavicle, the suprascapular nerve will be seen traveling laterally under the omohyoid muscle. This muscle is visible as a dark narrow band. Insert a needle lateral to medial to place the tip under the muscle and inject here. I find that the nerve does not have to be specifically targeted and in fact I would rather stay a little bit away from it rather than be too close to avoid any risk of mechanical injury to the nerve. Here we advance a little bit further to pierce the muscle so as to get spread under the muscle itself. Injecting 5 to 10 milliliters of local anesthetic here will spread under the muscle towards the nerve and anesthetize it. In this post injection scan, we can see how the local anesthetic has filled the sub omohyoid plane through which the nerve passes, but does not track proximally, thus reducing the risk of any phrenic nerve paresis. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it back to our chair now.